Hello and welcome to this video on differential equations. In this video I'm going to focus on um, a classification method for uh, systems of 2 by 2 linear differential equations. So uh, we're going to be paying attention to um, ODEs of the form where you have an XY prime equal to some matrix ABCD multiplied by XY and I may use the notation at times a times vector x, where vector x is, consists of component x and y together as a vector. Okay, so um, there are a bunch of cases that I want to uh, describe. So let's just go through these cases. So um, there's a bunch of cases that involve real eigenvalues for a. And those ones, I can list off a whole bunch of subcases. Uh, so let's say there are uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both strictly negative and distinct. And then we have a case where lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both positive and distinct, so not the same value. And then we have a case where lambda 1 and lambda 2 have opposite sign, so I'm going to represent that by just saying that the product of the two eigenvalues is negative, and that just ensures that if one is positive for that inequality to be true, you have to have the other negative. And so that's a third case. Um, and then those are sort of the robust cases. What I mean by that is um, they aren't very delicate, but now we're going to have some that I would call delicate because they involve an equal sign, not an inequality. So we have, let's say, case D here we might have uh, repeated eigenvalues. Let's say I'll just write that as lambda 1 equal lambda 2. And both of them, uh, well, they have along with them, they have two eigenvectors. And so that's sometimes described as having uh, algebraic multiplicity 2, that means the root has uh, squared on it in the characteristic polynomial and geometric multiplicity too, meaning there are two eigenvectors. But it's possible when you have a repeated root that the geometric multiplicity is not two, that it's only one, and that would happen when you have only a single eigenvector. And when that happens, you need to find what's called a generalized eigenvector as well. Uh, and for each of these two cases, actually, I should have put these in. So I guess I have a couple more. So we have, in this case, this is, uh, these can be both negative, or we could have case E, where lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, and they're both positive with two eigenvectors. And then, let's update that. So this is case F now. And here in this case, we're going to be dealing with, let's say, both negative, and then g, we can have lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, both positive, and now this one with one eigenvector, so also the um, geometric multiplicity 1 case, but just a different sign. And then we got h, let's see, we've got now uh, one lambda is negative, and the other one is 0, and then i will have lambda 1 lambda 1 positive and lambda 2 is equal to 0. And then we have, let's do this up here, a second set of cases. We have complex eigenvalues. And so here there are fewer cases. There are not as many special ones. So here I have um, case, we'll call it, go back to A again. So we have uh, the, the eigenvalue is complex, but we're going to have the real part of the complex eigenvalue um, being negative. And now remember, when we have complex eigenvalues, lambda is going to be equal to alpha plus and minus beta i. So I don't need to talk about the real part of the first or the real part of the second. It's just alpha. So in this case, I'm saying alpha is negative. And then we have the case where the real part of lambda is positive, and then there's the boundary case between those two where the real part of lambda is equal to zero. 
Okay, so um, what we'd like is uh, a, a simple way of characterizing all of these cases quickly in a simple context. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to point out first that the characteristic equation, which is what gives us the eigenvalues, you'll notice even though there are four entries in the matrix, it sounds like there's four degrees of freedom in what can happen with the eigenvalues. But when you get to the characteristic equation, which we find by taking a minus lambda i and finding the determinant, we find that the um, characteristic, characteristic equation is equal to lambda squared minus a plus d lambda plus a d, oops, a d minus b c. And if you recall, there are definitions for these things. This one is the trace of a times lambda, and this is the determinant of a. So even though a, b, c, and d seem to have four degrees of freedom, when it comes down to finding the eigenvalues for that matrix, all we really need to know is the trace and the determinant. So then the question is, can we decide which of all of these cases we're in just by looking at the trace and the determinant? And the answer is we can almost determine them all separately. So the ones that we can, uh, we can, the ones that we can't actually identify just looking at the trace and the determinant are the only two where there's a geometric component to it, which is these four here, where we have to find the eigenvectors to determine what's going on. All the others we can determine from the trace and the determinant. So let's see how that works. So, um, so remember that we can always solve this equation using the quadratic formula. That's the trace of a, which is minus the coefficient on the lambda term, plus or minus the square root of trace of a squared minus four times the determinant of a, and all that divided by two. Okay, so first there's an easy way of determining what's going on in case two. So case two happens only when four times determinant of a is bigger than the trace of a squared. So that means we have complex eigenvalues. Okay, so once we have complex eigenvalues, we know that the, in the real part is trace of a divided by two. So here's one inequality in determinant and trace that tells us that we have complex eigenvalues. And then we're in case a, subcase a, provided the trace of a is negative. And we're in case b, provided that the trace of a is positive, and we'll be in case c when the trace of a is zero. Okay, so what that looks like, I can draw what I'm going to refer to as the trace determinant plane, and I can say all matrices will sit somewhere in this plane. I calculate the matrix, matrix's um, trace and its determinant, and that gives me a point in the plane, and then I can check these inequalities here, and we'll see um, where it lies. So first of all, notice that the determinant a, if this is our y value and this is our x value, then there's a parabola y equal 1 over 4x squared, which looks like this. And if we're above that, then we have complex eigenvalues. So all of this region up here has complex eigenvalues. Now let me first just highlight parts of it. If the trace of A is negative, we're in this regime here, and our matrix has a negative real part. And if the trace of A is positive, then we're in this part here. And if the trace of A is, uh, let's see, is zero, then we are lying right along this axis here. So these three cases that we had before, right up here, the complex cases break down into these three regions in the trace determinant plane. All right, so now that we've got those down, let's see if we can get the rest of these. So looking through them, if, um, 
if we have that So let's actually erase this. I'll leave the map, the trace determinant plane there and just get rid of this for now. And so let's take a look. When do we get, um, for example, two negative eigenvalues or two positive eigenvalues? So if we take a look at this piece here, you can see that we have trace of A plus and minus, and then what's under the square root sign if the determinant of a is negative, then we're going to have the trace of a squared plus something. So that's when the determinant of a is negative. So what that means is that if the trace of a is a positive quantity, we start off here, trace of a, and we're going to add a number that's trace of a, oops, I forgot the squared. We're going to add a number that's the trace of a squared plus something, and that means the square root sign will make it a number slightly bigger than trace of a. So we're going to have to add a number bigger than trace of a and subtract a number that's bigger than trace of a. So if we start it above, then we're going to have one below and one above. Similarly, if we started below, if the trace of a was negative, we're going to be adding a number bigger than the trace of a and subtracting it. So here in both cases, we'll end up with one eigenvalue being negative and one eigenvalue being positive. And so that happened when the determinant of A was less than zero. Okay, so where is that in the plane? That's a big region. So that is down here. Let's see here. So this whole region down here is where the determinant of A is negative, and we call those saddles. I should have given these ones up here names. So um, if you look at the shape of the, um, the, the solutions in the phase plane, when you have complex roots with negative real part, the negative real part gives you exponential decay and the complex part of it or the, the imaginary part tells you that there's an oscillation and so what that means is that you have an inward spiral and when there's a positive part the real part is positive that means you have an outward spiral and then right between you have closed loops that come back on themselves because there's no exponential decay and so these ones are called stable spirals. And here are unstable spirals. And these are called centers in the middle. And now we have, we have all the complex parts and now we have the saddles down here where we have one lambda positive and one lambda negative. Okay, so what we have left to determine is what happens now when the trace of A is positive. So when the trace of A is positive, we have, let's say zero is here, and let's say the trace of A is positive, and now the determinant of A is positive, and that means that we're taking a difference between these two. Now suppose the difference is not big enough, we're still underneath, underneath the quadratic that gives us complex roots. And so we're going to get real roots, but when we take away a little bit from the trace of a squared and take its square root, we're going to have something less than trace of a. So that means we go down by something not quite far enough to go over the origin and up. So if the trace of a is positive and we're in the real case, so in other words, uh, up below the parabola, then we have two positive eigenvalues. So that's the region out here. And when we have two positive eigenvalues, we have a U-like structure to the solutions, and they're all coming from the origin and moving outward exponentially. And then similarly, if we're down here, with the same condition, now the trace of A is negative, then we get 
add to it a slightly sm a number smaller than trace of a because we're adding we're subtracting from trace of a squared here and that puts us in this region over here and there the solutions will look similar but now they're all coming in and so those are stable and we call both of these nodes and this is a stable node and this is an unstable node and so now we have all the big regions um, the last things that we have to sort out are all of the boundary cases so that's here and I won't go through those carefully because I don't want this video to go on for too long but what we have is so um, so we still have to deal with when lambda is negative and lambda 1 is negative and lambda equals 0 so h is along this line here that's 1h and 1i is along this line here let's do that in a different color so do that in green here this green is 1h and this red here is 1i and we have let's get rid of some of this stuff here we have a few more cases where are we done let's see uh, oh yeah just along the parabola what happens right along the parabola so along the parabola here we're at the point where the square root sign has become zero this, the thing under the square root the discriminant is zero and so what we get there is uh, a repeated eigenvalue we get trace of a over 2 and trace of a over 2 are our eigenvalues and so those ones now depending on whether we have two eigenvectors or one eigenvector those will either look like this all solutions coming straight in or they could have if we have the only one eigenvector then we have a hook like structure to those solutions all coming in and on the other side we have this one and here we're going to have the same story but now they're going to go outward because we have positive values to those eigenvectors to those eigenvalues so there we have a steady state with all of them going out or we might have if we have a degenerate case we have these um, hook-like structures and those are all going out now and that is the this is the one e vector case and this is the two e vector case and the same thing over here two eigenvectors and this is one eigenvector so that is our complete classification of steady states depending on what you find happening with the trace and determinant and thus with the eigenvalues.